Once in the camps, the Chinese wanted recruits for their own vision of a world revolution. We will re-educate you and you will learn what the truth about this war is. Uh, we will not harm you if you obey our rules and regulations. But you will learn with us. That was our first hint of the famous lenient policy. We would have every right to kill you as war criminals, but we know you are dupes and tools of the Western imperialist powers. We are going to re-educate you and give you a chance to learn the truth. Therefore, because of that, we will be lenient and spare your lives. That was our first indication of the great a process of indoctrination that went on in the prison camps. The total attempt by the Chinese to give us the teaching of Marxism-Leninism and, if possible, to convert us to the uh, point of view and to the ideal of the ultimate dictatorship of the proletariat. It was all in that sort of attitude of we were naughty boys uh, and we'd been given another chance and we'd got to buck our ideas up. Uh, and get down to realizing how to lead uh, a moral life. And if we did that, all would be well with us. If it didn't, then they would be tough with us. The Chinese released photographs of happy, contented inmates. But behind this propaganda was something far darker. Prisoners died of disease and malnutrition. And punishment for those seen as reactionaries could be cruel. Colonel Khan of the Gloucesters suffered beatings and solitary confinement for two years. Only 46 out of 622 Gloucesters escaped Gloucester Hill. The few returned to the UK as heroes. It's not very hard to imagine the feelings of the men of the Gloucesters reaching Southampton aboard the Empire Foy. And here are the men who survived and escaped from that Imjin River battle, less than a score of them. They added glory to the great traditions of their regiment and the British Army. The last stand of these glorious Gloucesters caught the imagination of the British public. But other soldiers returning from the horrors of Korea felt ignored. When I came home, um, no welcoming party, no nothing. I came off a train and I had about three miles to walk to my home, which was out in the country. And um, I happened to meet one of my old schoolmates. He said, oh, hello, John. He said, uh, you look nice and fit. You've been on your holidays. I said, on my holidays, yes, so you, you put that. I said, I've been around the other side of the world. I said, we've been out in Korea for a year. Where's that? Never heard of it. Nobody wanted to know. Oh, you were in Korea, were you? Uh -huh. That was about as far as it got. Nobody wanted to know. Of course, it already had the Second World War, which was quite an exciting time, and more directly involved with it with bombing or one thing and another. People who were sick of wars who didn't want to know about wars. In July 1953, news reached the camps that the fighting in Korea had ended. An armistice was signed in a new demilitarized zone back on the 38th parallel. Part of this agreement was a prisoner exchange. One of those prisoners swapped was Guy Temple. During his captivity, he had had a gun put to his head with the threat of execution after an escape attempt. Now, with the other POWs, Guy was going home. As we went across the bridge, the first thing we knew we were on the right side of the line was when we saw this sergeant military police. You saw that red cap and you thought, wow, yes, that's it. And I remember one or two of the soldiers um, gave him a hug and a kiss, which he was probably unused to, and we went on. And you know, once heard all this business of walking on there, but that was exactly how it was, walking on air. By November 1953, all the prisoners were finally back home. We'll gather lilacs in the spring again. 
and walk together down an English lane until our hearts have learned to sing again when you come home once more. Yes, when I saw my wife, it was wonderful. We put our arms around each other on the dock at Southampton. Um, and I just felt I'd like to spend the rest of the day holding her like that. And then I, the, the next and, and perhaps an emotional moment was seeing my son who hadn't seen me for two and a half years and really didn't know who I was. Um, and so I, I cooled it. I said, hello, something like that, without many embraces and so on. I knew he didn't know who I was, except he guessed because I was with his mother. His mother had said I was, she was coming down to meet me. Uh, I said, yes, I said, hello, old chap. And I just shook his head. You and I. Returning with his men was Colonel Kahn of the Gloucesters, coming home to receive the Victoria Cross for his brave leadership, but still with a fierce pride in his men. The majority of them, I think, have done extraordinarily well under very difficult circumstances. It has been a, a strange experience, and uh, I'm very proud of the way that they've come out of it. They are all just about as keen as I am, I think, to get away to their homes. And, uh, I think that, uh, all of us very soon will have forgotten this particular experience. Half a century after the battle on the Imjin River, Koreans cannot forget. Their country is still divided. A demilitarized zone still separates the communist north from the south. Every year on Memorial Day, school children lay flowers on the graves of the 57,450 UN troops who lost their lives defending South Korea. Here are the graves and the names of the 400 British dead and missing on the Imjin. Their comrades who survived have also not forgotten. On this 50th anniversary, they ask that we remember too. Many faces come to mind. Um, and it's quite right that we should commemorate their, their lying there, as it were, as a perpetual reminder to us uh, that there were various bills to be paid for countering aggression, and they paid the full whack. It's unfair that so many men should be killed and, and so many men should go out there and fight and put their life on the line, fighting for the principles of the United Nations, not to be remembered. It is unfair, but you can't help human nature, can you? If people don't want to remember it, they won't. The British soldiers that went out there and fought and they've, come, they've got something to hold their head up for. They can be proud of what they did out there. And I'm only sorry that everybody couldn't come back, but wars don't happen like that. <laughs>